Hello everybody, uh, thank you very much for joining us for our, our last in our series of three webinars, the, the Future Focus series. Um, this week we're going to be looking at the future of luxury um, and have a little chat about how we think that may, may be forced to change, how it may adapt to a post-COVID world. Uh, I'm your host Colin Baker, I'm the Executive Chairman of 365 Aviation. Um, and just a couple of things before we start, uh, if you look on your screen there's a couple of buttons there. Uh, there's a chat function, so if you want to share comments and thoughts amongst yourselves with everyone, uh, that's fine to put in there. If you've got a specific question for one of the panellists, if you could hit the Q&A button, um, and we might interrupt in the middle of it and, and answer those questions live, but we'll probably get to that, say, 15 minutes at the end of that for, for some questions. Um, so let me introduce you to our panel. I think we've uh, assembled a fantastic panel this week. Uh, really covering, I think, covering a broad spectrum of the luxury space. Uh, we're certainly covering jewellery, uh, fashion, um, and also the slightly broader world of, of art and antiques. Um, uh, let me introduce Stephen Webster first. Uh, you may well recognise his name. Um, he's got a jewellery company by the same name. I think he founded it just a little over 30 years ago. And from what I can see, has brought up quite a reputation, certainly not just in the UK, but across the world. Um, how do I describe his work? Uh, contemporary fine jewellery, I think, is the is the sort of official title. Uh, for my untrained eyes, it looks kind of quite edgy, quite rock starish, um, flamboyant sometimes. Um, so uh, uh, beautiful collection. Uh, not just jewellery, actually, does her, does homeware as well. Um, I think it's fair to say that he's got a very distinctive style, which is which is sought after by rock stars and celebrities around the world. Um, I think important to this conversation as well, he's been at the forefront of, of sustainability, uh, of understanding and, and sourcing responsible materials. And I think he was doing this long before it was very fashionable to do this. Uh, our second panellist is Alice Templey. And Alice founded her own fashion line, uh, I believe it was in 2000. And I believe it's also called Templey after herself. Uh, she's a graduate of the Royal College of Art. And how do I describe her designs? I'm no, certainly no fashion uh, expert, but I guess they're sort of modern bohemian designs, um, certainly maintaining some British heritage and some quite intricate sort of what looks like handwork as well on some of the designs. So uh, some really quite beautiful clothes. They're available around the world. I think they're in 30 countries, four, four dedicated stores. Um, I think Alice also, again, has genuinely cared about sustainability, especially in the fashion industry, which the last few years it's been spoken about a lot but uh, I think Alice has always been uh, very mindful of, of, of fair trade and where the fabric source from where the fabrics being manufactured etc etc and she did one win the the butterfly mark for positive luxury before um, should mention that Stephen and Alice are actually both MBEs uh, and my final panelist is Freya Sims uh, she's the chief executive of Lapada. Um, I suspect many of you probably would have heard of that. That's the Association of Art Dealers and Antique Dealers. Uh, her background is, I guess, from the, the auction houses. She's worked at Christie's, at Bonhams, uh, Sotheby's. I think at Sotheby's she was a head of marketing and also special events. Uh, in 2010, she founded her own consultancy and she works across a, a fairly broad spectrum of, of arts, luxury and design sectors. Uh, some of her clients, again, you, you may have heard of, you may have attended, people like Masterpiece London uh, and also the Affordable Art Fair, which, which I visited in, in Hong Kong before, which is always a great, great event. Um, also, she's been a recipient of an award, the, the Queen's Award for Excellence in Enterprise. Now, my last introduction is our moderator. Uh, we're very, very lucky to have uh, a star from uh, Hong Kong TV, Rishad Salamat. Uh, he hosts the, the morning business show every morning. I get to see him on TV. Uh, but he's a veteran of, of Bloomberg. I think he's one of their longest serving anchors. Uh, he did work in London for a long while, but he's been in, in, in Hong Kong for a decade now. Uh, he's interviewed just about every business CEO you can imagine. He's also uh, interviewed several uh, high level political leaders. He's Bill Clinton, Gordon Brown, Tony Blair. Um, uh, so yeah, very experienced commentator. We're very lucky to have him moderating. And he has just joined the call. So uh, let me hand over to Richard. Just uh, hold your horses for one second. I'm having a serious technical problem. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me. We can hear you, yes, we can. We can hear you. Lovely. Um, I don't know where you started, but I'd like to just um, kick things off with a, a look essentially at 
what you think luxury is. I mean, luxury can be having a roof over your head, it can be having a bed, but from your standpoint, what does it mean for you and what does it mean for your clients? Who? Who anybody <laughs> first, let's start with Freya. Okay. <laughs> Um, well, I think uh, what it means for my clients and for the art and antiques in sector is one thing. What it personally means for me is the idea of kind of having a hug with a mate in a pub garden. But um, I think there is uh, some, you know, there's, there's been a lot of difficult things, but there is a, a kind of um, a way that we can sort of... Uh, do things quite differently, I think, within the art and antique sector. And some of that luxury will be about time, anticipation, and being able to really give people attention in a one-to-one -one way in their galleries. Um, I think that the kind of uh, joy of craftsmanship is always there. Um, and I think the thing that we need to work hard at at the moment is giving people the access in these times to be able to see those things. Maybe some of that through some kind of content and, and a hybrid between a virtual and a physical world. But I think that um, the joy of beautiful things never goes away. So um, it's finding a way to help people access that really. Stephen. Um, well, I, I follow on. I agree with everything that you say and I, I um I think there's, you know, there's, there's something that's got to feel um, that there's an exclusivity. I think the craftsmanship, I mean, certainly in my industry, it's, it's kind of so vital. It's, it's, you know, we're a craft industry and, and I think, um, you know, those things are very important. It's something that's a luxury. I think there's definitely um, a debate that was already being had, but I think now is probably, something that will become more of a focus of, of you know, is this something that needs to be associated, um, you know, with a logo or is it something that can stand on its own and still be a luxury, which, you know, I think it can, um, you know, as long as it ticks the codes. And, and also, um, you know, how can luxury be something, and, um, you know, we're talking about within the luxury sector, so not, not like soft toilet roll or something being a luxury, but something in the luxury sector that, that, that can feel a little bit more accessible, but retain those codes. And I think it's something that we're very focused on. I, I feel that the next step, you know, after this period, I think it will be quite important that you can offer something that doesn't feel massively elitist, uh, but still is a luxury um, just because it's still special and it still has a uniqueness and it's still possibly bespoke. But, you know, the more you layer on, the more it's going to get expensive. But I still think there's, there's, there's a level that you could say, this is luxury. It feels like a luxury. It, when you wear it, you feel like you're wearing luxury and, and it's allowed more people into the space um, than, than just this sort of very elite um, position of luxury. Alice, obviously. Um, well, I think it's all about authenticity, really. And I think now, um, more than ever before, we have to tell our stories very, very um, clearly. And we're just rebuilding our, our website, going through all of our um, imagery, just to make sure that that story is very, very clear. Um, I think authenticity, obviously, and craft for luxury, how things are made, where things are made, the sustainable angle of everything now is going to be at the forefront of everybody's a conversation anybody building a brand now or reviving a brand or keeping their bad brand going through these times is all going to have to put that at the forefront of what they're doing um, and then it's telling the stories about it it's about the craft about the people behind it um, and really engaging with your clients so they understand what they're buying and it's like an emotion more of an emotional attachment whether it's through the specific craft characters behind it um, the fabric being used, the kind of the love that goes into each piece. Um, and I think this whole situation, this awful situation that we're in, is going to slow things down. Um, so, you know, there's going to be less collections, less product, which means we can do marketing and storytelling much more in depth around everything that we make. Um, and we're not flooding people with product, which means they'll be able to pinpoint things um, and connect with them um, on a slower cycle. So we'll be making things and they won't instantly be replaced by other things and then into the sales system, which makes luxury very, very unluxurious. So the slowing down of the cycle, sustainability, and I think 
um, yeah, authenticity at the, the heart of what luxury stands for. We, we can't hear you there, Rish. Rish, we can't hear you. Rish, we, we couldn't hear that, I'm afraid. Um, let, while, while, while Rish sorts his, his audio out, I'll just um, <laughs> from our business. Oh. My, my question is, uh, what have you been doing during this period of lockdown? Uh, you know, how do you, how have you been evaluating your business? And that question is for Stephen, first of all. Um, well, I think, um, first of all, there was a little bit of, of panic. Um, I don't think anyone couldn't have faced something about that just because, you know, it felt like, right, everything stopped and, and now how do we kind of work our way back in? And, and over the last now 10 weeks, I've done very much what Alice has described. I think we've tried to tell the compelling story that I know we have um, and share that more than we ever did before. Um, you know, the platforms that have all become so familiar with us, uh, technical apart, um, have been so perfect for doing that, you know, of being sort of facing your audience. And, and you know, last week we did, for the, we had a launch, we, we had a collection that was already made and it was going to get launched in Bergdorf Goodman and, you know, in a more conventional way. Well, that, that obviously didn't happen. So we think, well, we should get it out there and, and you know, so we, we sort of put it out in a, in a very much a storytelling way of, of how, how I shop for stones and, you know, what makes it different to somebody else's story. And, and I think people could see us delivering that from our kitchen. And I work with my daughter and my wife, so it felt like sort of a family affair. And that was hugely received with huge positivity. And I, I think that was was great because you know you say well we've we've sort of found a way of working when it felt almost impossible um you know and as we go forward i think more channels open up but i'm, I'm definitely going to retain that and by the sound of it alice is there as well we you know and it is about i think compelling stories and and never underestimate how other people are interested in in things like craftsmanship and, and selection of you know, me, it would be my gemstones and materials and someone else's fabrics, but it's, uh, they're good stories. Um, Alice, I mean, was it, did you take it as a, a time for reflection? Yeah, I mean, completely. And we were already questioning the cycle of how many collections we were doing, how many shows and events we were supposed to be putting on, um, basically trying to keep the wholesale market busy and the department store market busy. And obviously everything is changing now with us selling more online and direct to consumer. Um, but it was just very, very, very important to see what we're making. And with the, without the, uh, the clients that we're selling to, the wholesale clients, obviously of all the shops in Italy and, and France and America are all closed, they're not accepting their orders. So we had to look at the amount of things we were producing. So we didn't go to producing our pre-fall collection or our winter collections. And we're reducing the amount of product that we're putting out there and we're stretching the delivery schedule for our summer collection so that will continue through September or October. So it was just being very clever with the product that we have and the storytelling around that product that we have. So we're not just automatically doing what we've always done is just pushing out collection after collection. Um, I'm very happy to say that that schedule will now change to two collections a year, which means that uh, we won't get as old as quickly. Um, but we'll be really able to focus on those two collections rather than the crossover of collections and the amount of product exhausting the teams and suppliers, expecting buyers to fly around the world four times a week for lots of fashion weeks. Um, it was in absolute insanity. And that is not a luxury space. That's a high street space of banging product out all the way and flooding everybody. Um, so well, Alice, we, I mean, did you look at your designs and, and did you look at your designs and see them in a different way and uh, uh, approach them from a different angle, perhaps, having thought about it? Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. We'll be doing less within the collections. The collection structure will be different. Um, we'll be doing more things which have a more attractive price point um, and also protecting things at that very, very craftsmanship high end level. Um, but really reducing the amount of what we do from 100 SKUs to about 50 a season um, with, with a few different clever drops. So the structure of how we're doing the whole process has changed from teams, suppliers, sourcing, um, 
looking at a very exciting uh, thing that we'll be, be launching in England, which is very exciting, made in England um, set up. Um, but it really You won't is... tell us what it is though, will you? Huh? What? You won't tell us what it is though. Uh, well, I'm signing the documents at any time this week, and then when, I, when I've done that, I can tell everybody. But uh, yes, soon. I shouldn't have uh, said. Frey, I mean, you come from a different angle altogether with this, don't you? I, I mean, tell us about your experience. And um, if you, yeah, please. God, I suppose so. Slightly different in the sense that I'm not looking after one business, so that we've got sort of over 500 members, and also within the art market, we're representing different people as well. So. Um, the, the areas we've been concentrating on is trying to sort of, uh, I would say, you know, within the art and antiques world, there are some people who are very slick and technical savvy and some who need quite a lot of support and help to get their things online. So we've been doing a lot of education and also support to help access new markets. Um, but the other side actually has been very much um, talking to the DCM, DCMS here in the UK and trying to get the art and antique sector as classified as part of this non-essential retail, which I'm pleased to say we've managed. So we will also be able to open on the 15th of June, um, albeit in, a, in a, a safe social distancing way, but that took a little bit of persuasion, um, but it's critical for the art and antiques industry to, to continue to be able to do, um, let people actually see some of the things. I think with with uh, prints and paintings and jewellery and watches, we have quite a good track record online. But when people are wanting to buy furniture uh, and larger kind of sculptural items, um, they do want to kind of be able to see those things in person if possible. Um, although we have seen a, a, a kind of increase in people buying things like that online, which has been great to see as well. Um, so yeah. Hope that answers it. I just, just, do you think, Fred, there's a crisis in this industry, or is the industry at the crossroads? Uh, the art and antiques trade. I think um, so. There's a potential a crisis. Maybe is the wrong. I mean, we're all having. We're in the in the state of pause during crisis, but. Um, I think that where the art and antiques trade is different to some areas and design. Um, is that an awful lot of our members uh, annual turnover over 50% is done at live events such as art fairs and antique fairs that I'm sure you're all very familiar with so Lepada, Masterpiece, Freeze um, so that puts quite a lot of um, stress on how people can find new routes to market and access that same volume of people um, but it's also created an opportunity. I think that when you're looking at talking about sustainability, I mean, there's nothing more sustainable than um, buying something that's kind of pre-owned, pre-loved and has been around for over 300 years. Um, so that's an area where we can really kind of drive that story um, and use it to our advantage. Uh, and I think it has also helped people understand, accelerate maybe, rather than understand um, how to get more of their things online. Uh, and we're seeing sort of quite a good, um, sort of good traction with that. Stephen, the next one's to you and it's just moving things along a little bit. And it's about luxury and how people want personalization perhaps here. And you know, how much of your business is moving in that direction? Uh, what I'm trying to get at is we had a lot of trends before COVID and this process, this lockdown, et cetera, and the way that we've had to change the way we work, the way we approach life, et cetera, that's changed. Has it accelerated some of those trends that you were witnessing before? And if so, to what? Steve? Um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely, um, I, I don't think there's, apart from the, the term, uh, coronavirus and COVID-19. I think m most of the conversations that we're kind of having were, we were already having them. You know, we, we've maybe been forced into um, addressing things a lot quicker than we thought, but, you know, I, there's been mention of, you know, responsibility and, you know, in, in your sourcing and, and your materials and transparency and, you know, all these things, which I'm assuming um, are just going to carry on the other end. Maybe they become more important, but they were already conversations to be had um, and I think um, you know certainly this idea of, of you know what what exactly is a luxury and Alice has said you know seven or eight whatever it was fashion shows 
a year were not the way. Um, I think that um, that doesn't feel luxury. Yeah, and Alice, I mean, this goes to what you do as well, personalization, or is it as one, uh, one attendee suggesting and asking about the democratization of, uh, of luxury here? You know, how do those two sit together? I suppose one is ultra rich and one is a sort of bog standard luxury, if you like. I don't want to you know, belittle people by saying that, but uh, your, your thoughts on that, is it, uh, you know, being exclusive and having, um, I suppose, uh, a wider audience as well? And this is to Alice. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, a wider audience is what's going to keep us all in business. And we have we have two different sort of clients. We obviously have our younger ones that are after the more free-spirited kind of bohemian uh, side of Templi that we're now looking at with a better, easier price point. And we also have people to come to us for the, the special, whether it be wedding or evening dresses. And we've relaunched recently our heritage, a heritage collection. So a bit like going to buy a vintage dress, you're buying a piece from the archive. Um, we've got 15 styles in that collection and people can come and order them in different colors. And we, re we reissue those now each season for all our wholesalers. So they're tried and tested. We know they fit. We know people love them. Um, why should something date? Why should something be out of date and in the sales system after three months, which is just insanity if you've got very beautiful pieces keep them going year after year um, and one of the, the proofs is that one of my wedding dresses that i designed about 15 years ago is still the best selling piece and we have pieces in the evening collection so why do the wholesalers always say well we want we want new we want new we don't want to see that again but actually now we're introducing those and they do want to see them again because they absolutely love having them out of other colors they sell they're the, the higher price point pieces that and they know that they're a success, there's not as much risk. So we're focusing on heritage as well as that um, daywear collection you, launches in two weeks. Do you think that having a ready to wear line somehow or the other denigrates your exclusivity for other lines? I'm sure you ask that question all the time. Well, the ready to wear line for us is accessible. Uh, the evening and the, the more heritage and the bridal is something different. You can order bridal in different colors if you want. But I think the accessible side of things is really, really important with the day wear because you're appealing to younger people. You have more reasons to wear it. I mean, not everybody has a reason to wear a dress that's sort of 3,000 plus pounds. Um, but everybody loves a piece of tailoring that's cut very well or a really beautiful day dress. Um, and that will now be 65% of our collection structure is the price point um, because we need to sell because people don't have the occasion to buy multiple of the evening dresses, even though the margins are better and they're aspirational and they're very, very you know, powerful for our brand image. We need to be driving our business through accessible product, but special accessible product. Can I just add Freya, something? Go on, so, oh, sorry. I, I think what Alice just said is really fundamental to, you know, what we talk about a future of luxury. And, and I, I'm exactly the same for us. You know, there was the time when you had jewellery for occasion. You know, you wore this in the evening, you wore this, you know, and you, you didn't wear your diamonds in the daytime, etc. all those things. And I, I think now, you know, we, we got to think that people's demands on their jewellery are a lot more, meaning that they just want to wear them all the time. <laughs> There's not so much about the occasion. And, and so, you know, something that if in a fashion term, and I, I don't really want to put what I do exactly into a fashion term, but, but you can't avoid the fact that people will want to wear things that suit their style and, and, and their, therefore their wardrobe, and, and they want to wear them all the time. And, but that doesn't mean it's now ready to wear jewelry. It's still, it's still a luxury. It's just that it's, you know, there, the occasion is, is sort of, has been slipping for a long time. And I think, you know, going back to what the future that we, we're about to face, certainly the, the medium term, I think that, you know, people thinking that they're, they're buying something that they only wear out to a fancy occasion is probably a little bit redundant at the moment. You know, yeah. so therefore, the, the, you know, there's still the luxury, it's still everything it should be, but, but its purpose is, has changed. Uh, Freya, you're not involved in this space exactly, but what you are involved in is perhaps adding some value. Do you, do you, do you see the industry that you're working in as working toward that and moving towards personalization as well, even though you're dealing with antiques, but what is the added value? 
I, well, I, I mean, I, I sort of actually think we do fit in that space, unless it's sort of some um, areas of modern design where they were democratizing it so it became less expensive. Actually, pretty much everything that you buy within our sector is a unique one-off because it's handmade. So I think that kind of the, the longevity and taking the word heritage, that craftsmanship that stands the test of time, the dove joint in a piece of furniture, the glaze, on um, a piece of Ming porcelain, that's kind of what I think most sectors are trying to emulate in a way of kind of having something that stands the test of time. So I, I think we fit in it. Um, just um, on, on that, go on, go on, your response to that, either one of you, Alice. The question, the question I, was, I was agreeing with her, but I can't remember what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> Adding value. Is it about, let's say, LVMH or something? So, you know, with the Uber rich saying something like, well, I'm not going to just go to Prada or one of those stores. I want to have something I'm going to be involved in. I want to help design. So it's going to be uh, whatever my name is by LVMH, you know, that sort of thing. It, you know, going towards the upper end of the value chain. I still don't understand the question. Sorry. <laughs> I'm asking you a new one now. <laughs> Good. Ask me a new question. I just did. You know, do you see more personalization? You know, more personalization. sorry, yes. I'm absolutely. I think people like they that they want to have a connection with something, they will be coming in and um and finding something unique. When especially in the Middle East, and we sell a lot in the Middle East, we have stores in the Middle East, people want unique all the time. Um and they want their own colors. And if we have a skirt in the store, sometimes people won't want anybody else to have it. So they'll buy it in every size, which is fantastic. Um, the, uh, it doesn't happen all the time, but it's great when it happens. Uh, also we're finding with, um, with our key wholesale accounts, they also want exclusive product, which can be quite a drain on us for the production side. But uh, people are definitely after something that uh, they feel has been made for them. Which is why we do well with bridal and dresses that are not just the wedding dresses. What's happening with the tech? Is it? Can, I, can I just, can I add one extra thing? I think that just in common with everything is that, that you know, expressing yourself through what you're wearing, whether it's um, jewellery, clothes, but I think you also express yourself through what you hang on your wall and what you sit on and, and uh, eat around. It's, all, it's kind of symptomatic. You're, you're trying to sort of show your unique flavour, I think. Um, yeah. Uh, just while you're on, Freya, yeah. what do you make of uh, another question? What do you think of revenge spending and how real is that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I can think of some of our members who might be quite pleased to be greeted with revenge spending. Um, it's, it's interesting. I wonder how um, internet or how global that would be. Um, I think that in areas where consumerism is very strong and people kind of want to want to sort of buy in certain countries that happens more than others. And I think you might see a little bit of it. I think whether you revenge spending in the art and antique sector it is slightly harder to do um, because it's I think you still need to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, you, you know, if somebody wants to redo their entire house through with Georgian furniture, I can think of members that will be very happy to oblige. We're hoping that the, it comes out okay, after, after, we're hoping that after COVID, the revenge spending comes out of everybody wanting to go out, celebrate, buy dresses, buy yeah. jewellery, buy art. Yeah. And we're certainly hoping, hoping for that uplift when we're allowed out, because I think people will go slightly crazy when they can go out and have fun again. Yeah. Um, so we're lining up everything to be ready for that moment. Stephen, okay, the range only may be one thing, but again, you know, everybody's sort of reacting to what's happened to COVID. But, and, you know, I think somebody said earlier that this is a, actually the Chinese have no word for crisis, they only have the word opportunity. If this is an opportunity. How do you look at it long term? Um, well, I, I think, um, you know, we, we've already had plenty of discussion about, um, I suppose, focus. You know, it's like uh, focusing on, on your strengths maybe and um and the fact that i think you know certainly stephen webster as a brand was built on on a traditional sort of model um and you know wholesale to retail 
which I think we, you know has been very, very challenged. Um, but nonetheless, we still have to go through it because you know you can't just stop everything and start something else. And so this this sort of moment, which now feels like quite a long moment, has has given us the opportunity to feel that we can be um, stronger and stronger in the way that we are uh, presenting ourselves in a digital space and try to communicate what we are that way. And um, I think that these are, you know, this, this sort of direct to consumer, if you like, and then driving uh, a consumer either into your e-commerce platform or into your showroom using the tools that we're now getting better at um, is, is something that we think we, we needed to do. And so now we, we feel that we've expedited the process and, and hopefully this, this in the end um, has, has a positive effect on, on our, you know, our ability to reach with, with, our own, with our own consumer, knowing that a lot of the, the wholesale model, you know, design, you know, vendor to wholesale retailer is, has been challenged for a long time. So I look at that a positive. Well, let's go on from that, Alice. You know, this is it. Okay, let's just move to your online presence. I mean, they always say, you know, you've got to uh, back your clicks with bricks, but should it be the other way around? Because, uh, you know, you have your bricks, you back them with clicks, because people actually want to have a touch and feel of what, you, what you're making, don't they? And, you know, what is it you see with the, not the end game, but the path forward with regards to that? I think online obviously is hugely important. It's not just our own channel, but all the other ones that we sell through is Netaporte, Matches, Farfetch, and also you know creating assets for them all the time. Um, this morning, I've just been working with a web team redesigning my entire website, which launches in uh, 10 days. And that is to make it more authentic. That is to get our strengths out there. That is to tell the, the story of the brand. If you go on there now, it can be so much better. Um, we've done various coffee table books in the past that are very, very beautiful and very true to brand. And it's about designing everything. So you're selling the brand. You're not, it's, not, it's not just click to buy. It's not just the commercial content. It has to be about storytelling. And it can be the craftsman doing the embroidery, the amazing lace machines in Italy ticking away. Um, you know, so you can feel, you can actually feel it. We don't need to see more and more commercial in images that look like a kind of a magazine. It needs to be moving. It needs to be engaging. It needs to be more humorous. And now because of COVID, the amount of things we're now doing on, on Zoom and our phones, or not all images need to be those sort of brushed images. Actually, it's better like Stephen's doing it at home in his kitchen. It's better to look kind of more tangible, more real. Um, and I think that, that will be you know a refreshing change that it just is it's just more real if you've got a real product and a real brand and a good story then just don't overcomplicate it um so we'll be working more like that working more on zoom with suppliers um traveling less because i'll be doing it down the uh, down the computer so i think this is a sort of time for how change of how we work how we show our work and how we communicate. And for that, I'm very thankful. I've always wanted two months off <laughs> and it hasn't been the easiest two months off, but we've done so much within those two months. Um, and it just proves you don't always have to be really, really busy to be successful. And it's quite actually the opposite. So hopefully everybody will learn this and we're not all phased into being bonkers too quickly. Um, and that everybody takes this change on to really make those sort of sustainable, focusing brand strengthening um changes that are needed because there won't be that many brands out there after this and so the ones that do get through this can be um just yeah need to be smart and remember the lessons we've learned Freya, i want to pick up on what alice was saying talking about authenticity that's authenticity means different things in your business and uh, tell me about that because each one of the uh, items you sell has a story behind it doesn't it yeah i mean i think um sort of trust and authenticity is something that's come up for a while now but obviously in an online world it's even more important and um i mean that is one thing that if people are buying art and antiques going through a vetted fair or a trade association like the pada brings um that element with it because of the strict vetting that you need to do to become a member so i think it, it's kind of helpful to to know that but i also think that we need to do more of that through the storytelling um i think that 
you know, human contact is something that is, I mean, we're probably all craving at the moment, but within the um, art and antique sector, that kind of enrichment of kind of building a relationship with somebody you're buying from, hearing those stories, seeing the object, understanding what it's lived for, through, seeing that patina, that's something that we can do in the, in the shops and galleries quite easily, but we need to help people get that um, online as well to have that kind of access and that sort of um, authentic sort of um, uh, hook, if you like. You know what? So the, the, yeah, actually, Stephen, can I, just, can I just stop you for a second? Because I just yeah. want to get to the authenticity thing. Because, I mean, yeah. the thing is, there's people and consumers and your clients are probably clever enough to realise the, the discrepancies, uh, discrepancy between, let's say, your story and the story of what you are designing yeah. with its intrinsic work. Now, how would you bridge the gap? And hopefully there's no gap. Is that for me or for Stephen? Sorry. No, it's a Stephen. <laughs> Stephen. Oh, sorry. I thought it was. <laughs> no, it's for you. Um, yeah. Don't well, repeat it. Yeah. Do, do repeat a bit of the question because I was yeah. actually thinking about what I, was, what I was trying to interrupt you to say. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I'm going to the whole thing about, um, you know, your clients, they're more and more knowledgeable, more and more savvy here. You know, what can you tell them about your story of your brand and then how it fits together with the true intrinsic value of that of that product essentially and hopefully there's no gap there at all right yes okay no i completely understand i think i'd sort of said right at the beginning that you know by using these these platforms and this moment to to be able to absolutely 100%, not, not just talk about authenticity, which I'm sure there's lots of that has, has gone on in the luxury sector, but you know, you can sort of show your own story. You can, you can really show it. I can show photographs from me, you know, in a mining area or, or going to Peru with fair trade gold and getting the first fair trade gold license. And these are, these are really authentic stories, you know, that in the end are, are what we, we're all about. And I'm sure we've used all different ways in the past to sort of, you know, mention them, and there's been features and lots of things have gone on which generally says, okay, you know, your brand has got, you know, some credibility. I mean, it's certainly been around for a long time, but I think this, this has been a great way of like bringing all that together as part of the story. And, and one thing I find really interesting, you know, because we were talking about, uh, you know, heritage, if you like, heritage and authenticity, which covers all three of us. And, and Alice has said she's brought back a heritage collection. And um, I did exactly the same. I mean, I've not spoken to Alice about it, but we, we have a collection called No Regrets. And No Regrets is all about that. It's bringing back things that, that, that were our journey, I think. Some of them were not ever bestsellers, but I think they were sort of maybe really key to saying what we, what we were about and, and you know, how we got to this place. And, and it's also huge, it's also proven to be very popular. So there's something very interesting about that. You know, sort of looking back to looking forward or keeping things for longer. Um, I think there's, there's an enthusiasm from that, from a client's point of view. Um, Alice, this one is actually a, a participant and they want to know, I think it's a very salient point actually, if authenticity is the key perhaps to the luxury experience, as it should always be perhaps, uh, is the era of celebrity endorsement dead or coming to an end or is it more selective? That would be nice. Uh, I think that the first uh, people that will fall out of this is people playing kind of the blogging sector. Um, we engaged in that once, which horrified me because I don't understand the need to do that when you've got an authentic brand, you've got like Stephen and myself and your our friends, artists are alive, it should be them talking about it, um, it should be us getting our voices over. I'm sure if a royalty or a celebrity wears something, then people have eyes on the brand and then they might go on and they buy it, in some cases it sells out immediately, but I think that... Um, it will more be about going to the brand for their voice um, and their their storytelling and less the kind of, I mean, a lot of celebrities from all the big brands, obviously all on their endorsements, they all get paid, um, as, as do bloggers. It's a very sort of gray, murky area for a lot of brands that have lots of budget behind them. 
um, and that's not particularly real. Um, we're very lucky we've never paid people to wear stuff, but um, I think it's more going to be about a brand and just believing it and it being real and the realness is going to come out. People aren't going to be buying as much. They're going to be thinking about what they buy. Um, and it's great to hear Stephen's voice talking. It's great to hear Frey's artists, seeing how they put the paint on, seeing how they mold something, sculpt something. And that connection with a brand um, is what we all really need to focus on. And we're lucky that we're alive and kicking and we're still telling our own authentic story. Maybe down the line, if the brands are still going, somebody else will be telling that story. Um, but we have um, valuable assets here because we built the business and we've been around for a while. So delve into that archive and tell the story about why you became a brand that sold in the first place. Freya, looking at those two uh, responses, uh, what's your takeaway? Um, I, I think that there is always going to be uh, an element, I mean, you know, sorry, the, the kind of the cult of celebrity and wanting to just follow a, a particular trend or a particular person and celebrity endorsement, uh, there are many things that, you know, uh, sort of chime badly with me. But I think we have to sort of admit that there is always a kind of an aspirational sense to some of the things that we're kind of involved in. And um, particularly, I think if someone doesn't have the confidence to have their own style or taste truly, then they look to other people. So um, I, I can't pretend that if certain people walk into a gallery preview, that doesn't make a difference to the, that kind of artists or exhibitions kind of end result. It definitely helps if um, certain people are seen kind of buying and when we had to close one event I was looking after to let Oprah Winfrey in to come in a little bit earlier that that didn't harm the sales that, um, uh, that goes <laughs> back to the, the, the idea of paying a celebrity um, honestly it throws all credibility out the window mm. doesn't it really I mean you know if Oprah walks in I mean Oprah bought two braces for me she bought paid for them and then she wore them on the cover of her magazine. It was some years ago. That was amazing for us. And it was real. She bought them and wore them. I think the idea of, of someone being paid to come and do that job is really, I hope, and like Alice, I really hope that we may see the end of it. I don't know if we will or not. But it's just okay. if, you, if they wear things and you don't pay them, it's absolutely great. Like, yeah. I, yeah, um, yeah, of course. It's we're safe. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Okay, so there's somebody who's actually deeply cynical there uh, as one of the attendees, and I really love this question. If, a, if authenticity becomes a trend, can it be considered truly authentic or a temporary fad? <laughs> I love that question. Uh, it's... Yeah. <laughs> That's silly. What do you say? Yeah. We will hope that it's... Uh, I think by definition, if it's authentic, by definition, it is not authentic, it's authentic. But I do love the cynicism there, yeah. I think, uh, <laughs> as a fan. Very um, good. Okay, I want to just get to, um, now, to Alice and to Stephen. I mean, you were awarded the butterfly uh, mark by Positive Luxury, and it ordered to you guys for recognition in terms of your positive impact in the world. Alice, what does that tell you about trends as well? Does it tell you about sustainability and how do you make that sustainability story solid? Uh, well, sustainability, uh, obviously everybody's jumping onto that bandwagon and using that word very, very flippantly. And we're very lucky to have the butterfly stamp, um, proof of where we source, how we supply, validation of manufacturers, um, not using any PVC and all those other horrible chemical bases, um, not treating the fabrics with things you shouldn't be treating fabrics with. And it's the start. I mean, there's so much more people can do by, by producing less, by sampling less, by traveling less, by um, and I think this whole change is going to enforce a huge amount more of natural sustainable um, solutions um, by the situation that we're in um, but I, it, is, it is hugely important and I think that the younger generation now are way more switched on to where things come from um, and that 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 storytelling for any new brand is no if that's not behind a new brand storytelling from the start I don't think they will really, really stand a chance um, but there is a lot more to do and that's the, the footprint of my industry definitely is is atrocious that how much people travel and the speed of consumption um, 
and that's just on the the luxury level let alone the the rest of it below um but i think yeah it's 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 super important we're looking at fabric we're looking up sorting a, a new factory in england we are um having absolutely uh, we'll have zero waste of anything um, making sure all of the, the print chemicals, which are obviously can be extremely bad, we're avoiding any techniques that incorporate those. So there's just so much to be done. I mean, with 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 every creative industry, there is there is waste, there is things that we use, um, and it's how we dispose of them, use them, avoid them. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's never it's never ending when creating anything. Uh, and also, Stephen. Do you reuse jewellery? Do you um, repurpose things yeah, that you've made? Yeah, we do. I, I mean, I, I have a, a kind of a, I, I, I suppose, I don't know exactly what you call it, but I have, I have something called Reset. And Reset is about exactly that. It's using what you've already got. I mean, very fortunate uh, in jewellery that, that due to its intrinsic value and and the way that you can work with the material, especially the metals, you know, you melt down a metal, you start again. Well, you've reused the metal, but you can do whatever you want with it. It's not restricted. Um, you know, gemstones is a bit different, but you can often find a place to, to reset a gemstone in a way that makes it, you know, suit the, the, uh, the current owner, or it could be someone who's owned a piece for a long time, so don't wear it anymore. Um, I've had many actually of my clients who have come in with, you know what may look like the crown jewels you know and they're saying well you know my husband used to buy me all this jewelry and now i've got no i don't know i don't know where to wear it can you help me sort of repurpose it in a way that makes it something i can wear more often so so there's that side of it and i think the other the other side that we which alice is talking about is is you know go through the whole business and and you know at every point you, you kind of look at it and think, you know, can we do better than this? And, um, and so we've, we've been going through that process for some years. And, and I think we were the most excited about it. it. It didn't seem that it was that interesting to my clients. That was some years ago. Now it's, if you haven't got a transparency, I don't think you've got a future. You know, and it, there's no interest in being opaque. It doesn't matter if it's politics or luxury or whatever it is. That will be your downfall. I really, really strongly believe that now. And, um, you know, hopefully that is the case because otherwise it was all pointless what we did. But, but I think it's been very important. Freya, how do you look at it? What prism are you looking at uh, that debate about sustainability um, being eco-friendly? Well, I suppose, I suppose one personally, um, I feel uh, sort of not responsible, but frustrated and a little responsible that we actually have owned that space for over a hundred years and we've been a little bit late to chime about it, our references, because they're literally, you know, recycle is one thing, but reuse and repurpose, which is what the entire art and antiques trade is all about, uh, <laughs> is something we do. However, I still think we can do things better. Um, I think that, you know, the way that we kind of pack and ship things and the kind of the customized crates, the things that we can do differently and use different materials. We could use less, you know, old diesel vans running around and more electric and possibly, dare I say, at some of the international art fairs, maybe we don't have to air freight to every single thing. Maybe this kind of um, move towards doing some more kind of virtual digital things means that we could ship a little less by air as well. Um, but, you know, we own it and we need to shout about it a little better, I think. Fred, are you noticing any difference in your business at the moment, you know, as we ease a little bit here and there? Are you seeing any different, um, a, a different mindset in any way at all, even if they're nuances? From, from our members, from the, the kind of gallery owners or from the consumers? Whatever side. I mean, whatever size of your business, because you, you, you're the crosshairs of it. Yeah. Way. So I think from the, from the members' point of view, they're actually just deeply involved in working out how to... So, you know, they've obviously done a lot digitally. Um, they've been um, actually surprised, I think, some of them selling online. The frustration has been 
once you sell, depending on the size of your item, how you then get it to anywhere, because the sort of air freight has gone up exponentially in terms of prices and there's a big waiting list. So there's some logistic things that have been going on there. But really, they're just involved in, in preparation of reopening, I would say, a lot of the shops and galleries, and they're kind of enjoying sort of coming out to that slowly and reconnecting. I think with consumers, um, if they're kind of marketed to in the right way, it's actually been rather nice. I think people are sitting in their homes looking around and if they notice something that they either want to sell or a corner that they want to kind of um, change and have something better, they, they've been buying. So it's actually, there's been more going on than, than I thought um, in terms of sales, which has been reassuring for some. Um, one other thing I would say though, is which is difficult, is we have a category, and this is more on the antique side rather than the art galleries, of people who do this. You don't ever retire as a dealer. You, you just kind of carry on until the last moment. And so uh, there are members who have been put in that vulnerable category who are particularly worried about how to keep their business going and whether they should come out and re-engage with people and how to do that. And those guys we're, we're having to nurture in a slightly different way because that's it, it's kind of frightening, you know. So trying to open up for them is, is a bit of a responsibility as well. I mean, we're talking about the future of luxury, aren't we? So, you know, are there any inklings you're getting, Alice, uh, for the, the feedback you're getting at the moment, uh, people's demands? Is there a, a change in fashion or a change in priorities, perhaps, even? What are you seeing? Um, well, changing the priorities will be different for wholesalers and, obviously, private customers coming directly to us. And first of all, we need our wholesaling shops to open and see what their demand is, how they're going to be buying for our spring collection, which we'll take to market in June. Um, are they going to be open? Are they going to be sitting on lots of stock that they haven't been able to sell for the next three months? Um, so <clears throat> it's very, very unknown how the wholesale model is going to uh, either come through it and survive with obviously department stores, and lots of people going down, smaller stores going down, uh, seeing what stock they're actually sat on. Um, lots of people refuse summer stock. So we've got lots of summer stock, which is beautiful that we can extend on our website. Um, and people are beginning to buy a little bit more. Um, obviously sales are on now. So sales always see a spike. Um, and then, uh, <laughs> unfortunate, but true. Uh, and then we'll be launching our new day collection in about 10 days time. And I think because it's, and some homeware, and because this is stuff people enjoy at home, it's very, very easy to wear. The sun will be out, summery, and we'll be selling the collection in the real season. So normally a summer collection would start going into sale in July, which is just ridiculous. Um, and that won't be going into sale. Uh, so people will hopefully have the occasion to wear something of a good price point, um, very, very beautifully done at the right time. So we're just changing the way we're, we're selling things, when we're selling things, selling things that are gonna be more true to season rather than selling winter clothes in the summer and summer in the winter, which has always been ridiculous um it's what everybody's always done um so to correct the seasons and we are seeing that people are beginning to inquire about things um maybe their weddings are going to be back on again so if you think about the wedding market <laughs> everybody had to cancel weddings um they weren't picking up wedding dresses weren't being able to come for fittings um so we're just going to wait for each area of the business to come up um, but really driving that new voice and putting the, the uh, stamp back on the ground in 10 days time with a new site and new product. Um, so that and, and to you, Stephen, the same, the same question, but add to that, what do you think the luxury experience is going to be like post COVID as well? Is it going to be different? It's, it's, it's about trends after, after this uh, whole crisis. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's Stephen. Okay. Um, I, I, I think a luxury experience, I think we're, we're probably still in the process of, of, I say perfecting it. I mean, we've sort of probably made some headway and I, I, I kind of speak in a little bit on a broader terms, you know, in the sector. I'm sure that, you know, a conglomerate uh, will, will have an idea of how they, they offer their luxury experience going forward. And, and I'm sure they will have success with it because they're very, very good at doing that. But I, I think for us, you know, it's, um, it's got to be, something that that we've kind of always felt we've offered only um 
you know, coming out of something like this, you, there's lots of talk in my industry of, of, you know, the emotional side, and I'm sure there will be an element of that. I mean, Alice is talking about the weddings coming back on again. Well, I think, you know, emerging from 10 weeks with possibly being locked in with someone, we're even going to see a lot more engagements or weddings or, or divorces or something. I mean, all of those things can be often celebrated in, in, in jewellery. I mean, I, I do make like that, that divorce ring, which could, could equate to something that we're talking about, the revenge shopping. You know, you go, you finally got rid of him. I'm going to go and celebrate and I'll buy myself a ring. So there, there is that. Um, but I, I think there's also about, you know, things that just make people feel good. And, and as humans, you know, we, we do need that frivolity, a little bit of it. Otherwise, everything just becomes pedestrian. And so I, I feel that luxury should fill that that place, uh, makes people feel good, whether they have less of it or they're more discerning. I'm, I'm for all those things, but but it feels a basic human emotion, you know, which is, which is about feeling good. Um, I'm going to ask this question. It's my final question to all, all three of you guys, um, which essentially is, if you can think of, one thing, I pity the person who's going to answer this one first, actually, but the one thing which you believe this crisis has changed, and what is that in your view? And really, I don't know to go for. I'm going to go, I'm going to go to Alice. Uh, speed, um, speed and, and the amount of product. So it's just going to slow us all down, which means we can enjoy what we do again. We can put more into each piece that we make. Um, we're not crossing over with lots of different seasons at the same time, traveling all over the place. Um, I'm going to be in my new studio on Skype, on Zoom, slower, actually designing and enjoying that process much more. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm taking this as very difficult two months with what's happened around the world but very very important time for us to reflect um and a lot of lessons learned mm. so, so slow yeah. down. i actually was going to say something quite similar or i was going to say slowing down um i think that there'll be great pleasure just back to the the sort of uber exclusive of doing a private view with just a few people of a kind of amazing collection like a Wallace collection and actually having the time to um, you know actually learn something um, and and really enjoy that and when you're buying something the customer experience of going into a gallery furnishing your home learning about where that piece has come from I think there'll be be time to sort of um, enjoy uh, the purchase from start to finish rather than just you know that quick kind of fix yeah I, I would, I'll go with creativity, which I think uh, both Freya and Alice have, have talked about the, the slowing down, which has allowed, I think, you know, creativity to come up to the top. Certainly, I, I you know, speak for myself in my life. I, um, I felt that we've had to be creative, you know, with the way that we, we go forward with our businesses, but also as, you know, actually fundamental to what we do. You know, Alice is a designer. I'm a designer, I'm a jeweler, a designer, and I, I feel like with the noise stopped, definitely, the phone wasn't ringing, that's for sure, um, you know, you, you can get really focused and, and it takes a moment, it didn't happen straight away, but I feel we got in the swing of it. And um, my head designer and I, we're working remotely, you know, we don't really see each other, we've, we've recently seen each other at uh, six foot distance, but, but we were working so well together and both saying that this has allowed that, you know. Creativity to come to the top. Creativity. Stephen, Freya, Alice, thank you so much. I'll leave Colin with the concluding remarks. Colin, thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Prisha, thank you very, very much. Um, brilliant. I thought that was a, a fascinating conversation. Um, I'd like to thank, thank all of our panellists. Thank Alice, Stephen, Freya. Thank you very much for, for spending your time with us and sharing your insights. Um, should also thank um, Charlotte and the team from Cultural Communications for helping us put this together. Um, young some heroes in the background looking after the tech and of course the audience. So thank you very much everyone for joining us. Um, a recording of this will be available. We'll, we'll distribute this through the, the, the same channels that we communicated with earlier. Um, yeah, thank you very much for, for joining us and hopefully we'll be seeing everyone out in the open very soon. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.